Hi, Mitchell Levy, global credibility expert, and uh, I am so loving the series, Leaders Living Their Values, and I'm going to add to that, and Making a Difference, and this is absolutely true for my good friend Chuck Garcia, and you know, I really like to throw the softball up front by saying, Chuck, hi, who are you? Well, let me first say back, hi, Mitchell, and thank you. <laughs> For having me. I'm very well. But your question is not really, how am I? Your question is, who I am I? And let me state that 95% of the people that I work with, when I pose the question, who are you and what do you want? The majority of them are unable to answer either one of them. So I am glad that I am here to be able to answer your question with great conviction. I am the luckiest man on earth. That's who I am. Mm. I am the product of incredibly loving parents that are no longer with us. I have a wonderful family, but the best part, the reason I am so lucky and fortunate is I get to go to work every day in the service of someone else's success. That makes me the luckiest person on earth. Wow. I don't think I've heard anyone say that yet. I love it. And I think what that means, if I'm if I'm interpreting in this, you love what you do. <laughs> <laughs> what gave it away? <laughs> <laughs> and so, first of all, let me tell you what I feel is the worst phrase anyone ever created: "Fake it till you make it." That's so incredible. Another paradigm that we are stuck in, that we're structured in, that we that we do is this thing called work-life balance. And I listen to you and I don't hear work-life balance. I hear life balance. I haven't worked a day in eight years. How's that? I, you know, <laughs> I, I, so if you're listening to this, how cool would it be if you could wake up one morning and be Chuck Garcia? Well, oh, I don't know God. about. <laughs> I don't know yeah. anybody wants to be me. <laughs> Just but, be but like I, Chuck. I, that sounds like a good it. TV series, buddy. Oh, <laughs> it is a good TV series. What I meant was, we'll get back to your TV series in a second. Sure. What I meant was that you could wake up in the morning and call yourself the luckiest person on earth because you haven't worked, even though you're out there supporting other people and make it. You're you're being of service to others. I, you're being credible and you're making money and you're having fun. And so you're not working, you're just living. Yeah, I, I, that is a blessing. And, and, and I think, Mitchell, you and I, we are, we've known each other for a couple of years. We are kindred spirits. We have a lot of things in common. Yet we both come from a place where I think it's fair to say that we can heighten the contrast between these two lives that we lived. And for many years, particularly in, you, know, you get out of college, you want to make a name for yourself, you want to do the best. I lived that life for 30 plus years, first under the tutelage of Mike Bloomberg, not because I'm a genius. I was just happened to be in the right place. I met this little company that no one ever heard of. People said, who's Mike Bloomberg? The guy had me at hello. I don't know why I got there. I don't know what made, what force in the world had me walk into the Bloomberg office one day. And then what was really an initiation of a career that I'm incredibly proud of but also I'm very fortunate that I can clearly look at the difference of how I felt about my career and the pride I have, but how it kicked into a completely different gear when I stopped worrying about myself and I could spend my time helping others. That is a vocation and something I wouldn't trade for all the money in the world because I've lived both lives. I've been on both sides of this equation. And I know how I feel on this side. And at this point in my life, I am in the right place. Mm. Mm. Uh, you just gave me chills. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In a really nice way. Now, I, I just, since I mentioned TV series, it reminded me that you, you got a pilot that you created in a TV series. And, and I, you know, I don't know if you should, if you should talk about the series or rather what, you're accomplishing like what is that what is that and what are the values that you're bringing to that series that you're sharing with others yeah well I, I think at first let me put it into context to explain from a business person from a business point of view the businessman in me 
for people, if you're looking at this on YouTube or you've got a visual into this program with Mitchell, you'll notice that behind me is a, a caption of my book called A Climb to the Top. And Mitchell knows this, but to those who don't, I'm a mountaineer. I'm blessed to have climbed mountains all over the world. And in my book, I use mountaineering as a metaphor for how to climb a career. The difference, though, is the backpack, the toolkit, is not mountaineering. It's not a crampon or an ice axe. It's the communication skills that I work so diligently to develop over my many years of public speaking. So when I wrote the book, I said, all right, what do I have here? Is this my brand? Is Does this represent me? But I state that because the book led to a few other mediums. It led to a radio show on 77 WABC called The Climb to the Top, of which I was very proud to host Mitchell. Thank you, Mitchell, for coming on. It was wonderful to get to know you. And through the course of this brand development, I am represented by this wonderful branding company. I'm going to give them a shout out called Two Market Media, who had an idea for a television pilot that we could, if all went well, use this as a basis for pitching the networks and the streaming services. And the concept that my branding company came up with is Undercover Boss Meets Amazing Race Up the Mountain. We wanted to develop a concept that was simple, it was accessible, and it was something that people understood. So we created this on a cast of four people that I guided them up a mountain. This was not a proverbial mountain. This was a mountain called Algonquin Peak, which is New York State's second highest mountain, which lives in the beautiful high peaks of the Adirondacks near Lake Placid, New York. But the pilot was all wrapped around what I do for a living as a coach, at least aspirationally, I try to help people to transform themselves not teach the leadership competencies. I can teach anyone to get on a stage. But when it comes to transforming, to being someone else, the way I transform myself from career one to career two, I now make a living helping people in whatever that transformation is. So the television pilot is called a climb to the top. Go figure. And it brings the brand to television. And we are currently in process of pitching it and <laughs> felt like a Seinfeld episode walking into NBC, but it was anything but that. It's a culmination of so many people who coalesced around an idea. We had a film crew of 14. They were awesome. And the idea, Mitchell, to answer your question as toward the values, it is our attempt to continue to bring our work to scale. We want to reach as many people as we can. I have the good fortune of teaching college at Columbia University. You can only reach X number of people in that classroom. You can only coach one coach, one coachee at a time. But because of our pride and our desire to bring it to a much bigger place, we decided let's give television a crack. So that's where we are. We haven't arrived at a network or a streamer, but I'm hoping one day, Mitchell, you will turn on your Roku and you will see a bunch of people on a mountain with a title called A Climb to the Top. Mm. Oh, I'm sure, Chuck, I'm sure I will. Okay, so we talked about you immediately opened with one of your core values, which was simply servant, servant leadership, you know, in terms of who you are and how you serve. What are some of your other values? Well, I think I look at my value system as a culmination of my personality, because when I, I hear the word values, it is manifested in how we act. And when I think about those values, because that's what people tend to associate you with, I come, three come to mind, enthusiasm, conviction, and generosity. And I'd like to think that whenever I approach anything, and I don't know if I was born with it, but it certainly has served me well. I try to the best of my ability to be enthusiastic about everything I do, especially when I'm invited onto a program of which you have no agenda other than to help me share my story and we can collaborate. I can't help but think, how could I not bring enthusiasm to such wonderful opportunities like this? But I also bring enthusiasm when I go out running every morning and when I go to the gym and when I sit down and read and write. 
So that's the enthusiasm. And it all starts there. And then the conviction and the generosity, I think that was developed over the course of time where I had to decide who I wanted to be in the world and how am I going to be Chuck Garcia. And when I think about those pillars, maybe there's a few others, but those are the three that I live by every minute of every day. Hmm. That's interesting because we all have different definitions of the word, yeah. of what the what the word value means. Right. And let's see, enthusiasm, uh, quench for life. Um, right. You you love who you are, what you do. Yeah. Conviction. Mm-hmm. Ah, conviction. In my framework, it's sort of the 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 intent and commitment to do the right thing. No question. And that fact, fact, that's not negotiable. That's the beauty of conviction. You don't even want to think about it as flexibility in there. It's not flexible. It's not negotiable. When you commit to something, that's where the conviction is. And I think I say that, Mitchell, because I know a lot of people that say yes to a lot of things. And then when you find out what that yes is to them, they put their name on a list. Oh, sure, I'll help you. They send you an email. That's not conviction. That's compliance. And there's a very big difference when when we work with people. You can't help but gravitate to the people that have conviction. They don't even always have to be right, but you need to know where you stand with people, why that's a value. Mm. If I tell you something and I align my actions and my words and I do it consistently without fail, that's conviction. I wish all of the people around us were that. Unfortunately, much to my chagrin, they're not. That doesn't make me better or worse than anyone. It's just a value that I live by because I know the difference. And I don't ever want anyone to think that if I say yes to you, that I've got the conviction and the commitment to do what I said I'm going to do. Because if I don't, I've not only breached my value, I'm letting you down. I don't want to do that. I'm going to say, so we're going to, just in terms of the pillars that we use for credibility, I'm going to say you've got the being known and being likable just wired, (laughs) right? So servant leadership, intent and commitment to do the right thing. And what you called conviction to me a little bit is internal integrity, Yeah. right? You, you, you're not going to say you're going to do it unless you're going to do it. And if you say you're going to do it, then you actually do it because, but conviction is a beautiful word, right? Potentially if I was redoing it, it's possible that that would be a better word. Mm -hmm. I don't know better, different. Um, Being likable, sharing your stage. Thank you for letting me come on yours and showing respect. Right. You came early. You know, we talked in the green room ahead of time. Now, let's talk about the the values. associated. by the way, I've not done this with anyone else. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. The values associated with being trustworthy are let's talk about let's talk about those because it feels like you've got them Um, showing up as your authentic self. Like, duh. Okay. Um, External integrity. Now, that's an interesting thing. Because I differentiate external integrity from internal integrity. And that's, by the way, just so you know, that's new. When when you were you were part of the summit, when I first announced all these results on credibility, I knew integrity was twice. I didn't know why. It was about a year later when, when I was talking to a, a woman by the name of Cheryl Lynn that I actually figured out the reason why. And it essentially, under being trusted, it's your external integrity, under being you know, being known, knowing you, it's your internal integrity. Knowing, now that you said it out loud, but this is true, knowing that when you say something, you mean it because you have conviction, just that's that's something to know about you that just makes it so much easier to do business together. Oh, in fact, I I look at all of us, or many of us in the coaching community, I think we think alike on this and we do. There are certain things in your world by which you can exhibit flexibility. You can say there's trade-offs, but this is the one thing in spite of everything else that may be negotiable. This isn't for sale. This isn't negotiable in that if I say yes, I mean it 98% of the time. This is the Clayton Christensen, who was a Harvard professor who wrote a wonderful book called and this, this book has been in my mind, how will you measure your life? 
And in the book, he talks about one of the precepts or the tools that he calls the just this once. And he was the story, kind of like the movie Chariots of Fire, where somebody would not run on the Sabbath. He was the same. He was a road scholar playing basketball for Oxford. And the final competition was on a Sunday, and that was his Sabbath. And he said, I will not play in the final. And his teammates said, you got to be kidding me. Why don't you do it just this once? <laughs> he said, if I do it just this once, I'll do it just this twice. And before you know it, I've breached it. It is easier to not ever breach that integrity mm. than to do it once. Mm. And that book had a profound effect on me because Clayton Christensen helped me with clarity as to how to think about what that inner integrity means and what it looks like on the outside. And that just this once is the most powerful precept I've ever read and that I try to live by. And that's why, Mitchell, the values can't be negotiable. Then it's not a value. You don't mm. partially value it. You either do or you don't. And that's where our reputations are, are gained. Chuck, I, there's a mic somewhere in my office that I got to hold up like this and just drop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Don't, don't break the furniture. You know. I, I know. I know. That's why I'm, I, 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 I will money. find. I will find one for the the occasional and rare person. Wait, uh, nobody get mad at me. Who actually says something so profound that the mic has to drop? Um, <laughs> well, cre credit to Clay Clayton Christensen for leading us, showing us the way. Uh, and and that's the thing that's that's part of sharing your stage. Yeah. Right. It's it's um I call it spreading cred dust. Right. Um, but I'll also say that you didn't say in your three values, but is so you from the first time I met. I mean, here's a person, by the way, who is the spokesperson for for Bloomberg for eight years. Mm -hmm. Like, I, how many you were on? How many stages around the world? And how many I did 150 like speaking engagements a year, consistently for many many years. And I did it in probably 20, 30 countries. It was a full-time job and it was the best job. I can't believe I got paid to do that job. It, but what I didn't know, Mitchell, when I was doing that job, it was really setting me up for what was what I do now. But it was just right, right guy, right place. I don't know, maybe a little bit of fate. How lucky was I? And I turned that into just out of good fortune. I turned that into my business from having built the credibility of the millions of people that have seen me speak. It wasn't a big leap when I let them know I can teach you. I don't, and I'm not teaching you to be me. I would never do that. I'm teaching you to be you, but I'm going to provide a toolkit that your college never took seriously. Oh, we don't teach us. No. And I'm going to provide a toolkit that in professional development, I know that you are keen on your professional certifications. You're going to take your exams. I don't discount or dismiss the importance of the technical competence. In fact, to the contrary, the capability is important, but that's only 50% of your brain. I think absent the skills that I have the good fortune of teaching, that's the right side of the brain. And I think now that I teach in the educational model, I, I just, my observations are we're teaching people to exercise half of their brain. Now, you have Stanford in your backyard and Berkeley and you have and I've got Columbia and NYU and these wonderful institutions. But when I show up to my Columbia classroom, I am looking to fill 50 percent of the rest of their brain that unfortunately, through no fault of anyone, this is not an indictment. I just think the cram exam regurgitate model is very good for the left side of your brain. But who's serving the creative, collaborative, and communicative side of your brain? Who better than me? I was like, what the hell? I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I do because as business people, Mitchell, it's an opportunity waiting to be underscored. And, and that's what I did. And it's just out of pure observation. I believe I can help fill that gap. And that's what mm. I do. It's a simple thing. Find the gap and fill it. I'm going to say more than believe having had time and spending time with you, you can, and you do for those people you work with. Yeah. And, and, but I want to say, I want to add something 
right? Because I want people to really see you. What's really interesting to me, even with all of that that you've done and all of which who you are and how you show up, I'm also going to say I know you as somebody who's coachable. <laughs> Thank you. You've coached me. I You have helped me immensely. And, and this is the beginner's mindset. This is you know, what they teach their kids in Japan. Don't don't get don't get arrogant. You know, we're, we're all each other's teachers. And when I met you, you immediately went to CPOP. I remember that you said, Chuck, what is it? And I struggled a bit with it. You helped me immensely. You brought a clarity to the simple question. Who are you that I can figure out? But when you said, Chuck, what's your CPOP? Can you put it into a sentence? I'm stumbling. I'm bumbling. <laughs> and then you brought your your template. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Your superpower, Mitchell, you got it. I needed that. And I and I thank you for that, for helping me to bring the clarity to the business I'd been doing six years previously. We met two years ago. Nice. Jeez. So you you taught me. My third pillar is generosity. I try and you learn as a mountaineer. You can't climb a mountain until there's a umpteenth degree of generosity on a team because you don't know what you're climbing into. You don't know the storms, the, the the crevasses. I have been through a whole lot of danger, but we got through the danger because of the generosity of the people that helped me to get through it. I was so inspired by my mountaineering experiences. I wanted to be able to bring that generosity and pay it forward because of the wonderful guides who gave up their time to be able to guide me. And they did that not just with their technical capability. That's half their brain. These mountaineering guides are full on 50% left, 50% right. Because the mountain guides are not just the guys who know how to climb a difficult rock face. They extend kindness, humility, and generosity at every turn. That's what inspired me to write a book called The Climb to the Top. That's what inspired me to become a guide, the proverbial mountain guide, and it inspired me to live my values. Because when I'm on that mountain, if those guides didn't leave, live those values, I'm dead. They keep mm. us alive and they get us home to our families. That is a very tall order and an incredible vocation. And mm. I take everything I can from those guides. Thank you to Mountain Madness International Mountain Guides, if you're listening, for everything you have taught me and inspired me to become a proverbial mountain guide to executives and to my college students, because I teaching college has been the most fulfilling thing I've ever done, beyond being a parent. My own children, I mean, my children are awesome. And, and there, there's tremendous fulfillment in that. But when you're walking into a classroom with a bunch of strangers that came from China and India and France and Russia or wherever they're coming from, they don't know me. I'm just another stranger that walked into the classroom ready to bore them to tears. That's what they think. That's the that's the default. And I said, I got to do better than that. They 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 owe I owe them my best. I can't imagine you boring a class of students um, ever. But they don't know that <laughs> when I walk in. I'm just another name on a syllabus. You know, know. it's just, just a college model. They don't know. Another they have no idea what they're in for. Well, they <laughs> sometimes I walk into the room on the first class and I will throw up on a PowerPoint. There's only three things you need to do in this class. And that's to think this way. And I toss up on the PowerPoint without actually citing it. I don't even recite it. I said, number one, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Be afraid of not learning from them. Number two, strive for progress, not perfection. Now, these are engineers. They strive for perfection. Number three. There is no failure in my classroom. There is only feedback. Now, Ooh. immediately, well, immediately they're suspicious. Like this guy Garcia is leading us down a trap. I know it. Like, don't be afraid to make mistakes. The educational model rewards you for what you get right and punishes you for what you get wrong. Right. I'm not there to punish you. I'm not there to judge you. I'm there to teach you. But the only way that we're going to make this work is you get comfortable mm. in the discomfort that you're not perfect. I'm going to embrace it. Because I know that's the space where we can teach you. And that's how I live my values. And, and if you do that and you get people comfortable in the fact that I'm not a shyster, I'm not looking to trap you, I'm not looking to hook you, I'm just here to teach you. And if mm. you want to take my lessons, 
bring it on. Wrap your arms around me. I'm here. If you Dude, think that's a bunch of hooey, that's up to you to decide. I don't know if I have a microphone, but I have one of these. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, just dropped it. All right. <laughs> Remember, don't break the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> it's a carpet, so I was okay. okay good. No, I love that. That as I'm listening, I'm interpreting. Well, that's how you be successful in business. That's how you be successful as an entrepreneur. That's how you be successful in corporate. Like that's important. And I'm thinking, and, and I've taught at the you know the MBA and the undergraduate level, and. Yeah. And then executive education. I'm like, right. yes, at executive education, that's what we do. But that's not what happens in the traditional K-12 or, you know, uh, college to college to grad school. Yeah, it's a different model. Oh, they are so lucky to have you. No, I, I'm lucky to have them. It, it goes both oh, ways. Oh, I agree. No, no, it's a win-win. Yeah. No, Chuck, great. based on how this went, is there a question I should have asked you that I didn't? The only thing I can think of is, and I think this is the question not to ask me, but the question that I ask everyone else. And when we opened up, and, and uh, let me relate a story here. There is a wonderful book written by a man named Rolf Dobelli. Have you heard of him? I do not believe so. He's a modern day philosopher. He was, he lives in Switzerland and I, I don't, I don't believe he's listening to this, but I love his books and it is, is, just look him up, Ralph Dobelli. And, and in one of his books, it struck me when I was reading it, he narrated the story and its story went like this. He called his friend Gary and Gary, what he got was a conventional answering machine. And when the machine kicked on, he said, hi, this is Gary. This is not an answering machine. This is a questioning machine. And I have two questions for you. The first one is, who are you? The second one is what do you want. And then you hear a pause for dramatic effect. And if you think these are trivial questions, consider that 95% of the people that I am in contact with never answer either one of those. Now, I stated that earlier in the show because I thought it was a good prompt for it. And that was just part in the levity of, of you and I finding our rhythm. But what you haven't asked, and I think this is the most important thing that I try to do as a coach and as a human being, I am saddened by the fact that there are so many people that cannot answer either one of those. They can tell me their name. They can tell me what you had for dinner. Where are you going to go on vacation? Okay, all good. And I respect that. But when I work with someone, I want, to, I want way beyond. I, want, I don't want surface level. I want to dig deep. And if you don't know the question or if you can't answer the question, who am I and what do I want? By the time we get through a coaching project, if I've done my job, and that individual has met me halfway, we walk out of there with a clear answer to both questions. So when I think about how we can serve, this is my value, how can I help serve the community? There's nothing I can do to teach you to cram, examine, regurgitate that I think can think of be of benefit. But what I can do is help you to help yourself and to find clarity about who you are, what you want, and why you live on this earth. So if I can accomplish that, whether it's coaching, whether it's on a radio show or a television show, and this is what we want our television show to be, that when people watch it, they're gaining clarity on the important questions of who they are and what they want. And if you don't know that, it's okay not to be okay. But if you never seek to figure out your answer, I think you're shortchanging your life. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I'm just using my experience and intuition of the wonderful people that I've seen transform through those through the answers to those questions. And if we're on to a formula that is helping people in ways that are contrary to the conventions of what education espouses, well, maybe we're on to something and we can make the better world one person at a time by the questioning machine and mm. getting people clarity on the answers. Mm. Mm. Three times, one podcast, three, 30 minutes long, three mic drops. <laughs> I'm just, if, if we this, can drop a few mics in this show. <laughs> if this is interesting to you, and by the way, I so agree with, with Chuck, 98% of people that I interviewed, now over a thousand, could not actually articulate who they are, right? And, and so 
if this is of interest to you and you're sitting here going, wait, I want to climb to the top or how about this? I want to at least be able to climb in such a way that when I'm done, when life is at its end, I did what I wanted. Yeah. And if you don't know what that is, you know, reaching out to Chuck Garcia <laughs> makes a whole lot of sense. And Chuck, how best can people reach out to you? I appreciate it. Well, if you remember my name, Chuck Garcia, and you you know how to put a dot com behind it, that's how to get to me. So my website is chuckgarcia.com. My book is A Climb to the Top. And if you Google A Climb to the Top, it'll take you to chuckgarcia.com. There's a contact page. You can always just click there and find me. Reach out. Tell me what you're thinking. Always delighted to be able to hear from others and to see where I can help them climb to the top of their proverbial mountain. Mm, I love it. Um, thank you so much for spending your time and showing up as your credible yourself as truly a leader living their values. Thanks, oh, Chuck. Too. Mitchell, thank you for the opportunity to be able to contribute to your wonderful program and to be able to have a voice with you collaboratively, because I always enjoy working with you, that we can do together. Because the last thing I want to leave you with, and this is what we teach in improvisation, all of us is better than any one of us. When we think about the power and the force of combining our powers, it doesn't get any better than that. So thank uh, you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to have come onto your program. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to seeing what we now we co-create together. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Hey, take care, everyone. See you at the next episode of Leaders Living Their Values. Bye now.